Welcome, everyone, to a special episode of Voices with Verveki. This is episode six of the Philosophy of Meditation series. I'm very happy to be here, and um, I'm going to turn things immediately over to my ongoing partner in this wonderful series. Uh, just so much has happened. I'm, I'm uh, really excited about today, and I'm going to turn it over to Rick Rapetti. He'll do a micro introduction of himself, because if you don't know who he is by now, uh, <laughs> that's a, that, that would be very odd. And then he'll do a more extensive uh, introduction of Massimo. So take it away, Rick. Thank you, John. Um, well, I'm the author, uh, the editor, rather, of the Rutledge Handbook on the Philosophy of Meditation, um, I'm a faculty member, philosophy professor at CUNY, and um, John, of course, wrote a chapter, and so did our special guest today for that handbook, and uh, that handbook inspired this this series, so that's why we're here. So um, enough about me. Let's get on to our guest. Um, like John, Massimo is a philosopher, scientist, author of important works, contributor to my recent anthology, which I just mentioned, which pro promoted this series. But Massimo is also a leader in the contemporary initiative to promote philosophy as a way of life. More particularly in this regard, he's an APPA, American Philosophical Practitioners Association Certified Philosophical Counselor. Uh, but more importantly, he's a leading figure in the revival of Stoicism. I first met Massimo personally at an American Philosophical Association convention in a hotel restaurant. Uh, when Ben Abelson and Marie Frequenyon, two more contributors to the Rutledge Handbook on the Philosophy of Meditation, introduced me to him as he was sitting at an adjacent table. Um, Massimo, do you remember that? Yeah, it's just it's a small world, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. There was a little coincidence, and then you, know, you wound up in my book because I thought, oh, uh, I know Massimo does Stoicism, and they do philosophy, and they do meditation in there. Let's see if he'd write a chapter for the book, and, and he did, and we're very happy that he did. It was a great chapter, by the way. So in, in this series, we like to mention connections with previous or future guests. So this is episode six. In episode one, John and I introduced the series, and we also focused on John's work that's relevant to it, as if John was both the co-host and the guest, uh, what John might describe as integrating 4E cognitive science with Eastern and Western contemplative philosophy. In episode two, we interviewed Pierre Grimes, one of the first contemporary Western philosophers to try to bridge Western philosophy, particularly Neoplatonism with Buddhism. He's also a philosophical counselor connected with APPA. In episode three, we interviewed Lou Marinoff, the founder of the American Philosophical Practitioners Association, or APA, whose work similarly bridges Western and Buddhist philosophies. In episode four, we interviewed Thomas Metzinger, whose work integrates analytic philosophy, 4E cognitive science, and meditation as a key tool in the exploration of consciousness. And in the previous episode, episode five, we interviewed Evan Thompson, who does similar work and is renowned as a trailblazer in bringing into existence 4E cognitive science and bringing it to the attention of philosophers. So far, all of us who've been here are interested in the links between philosophy, meditation, and the nature of consciousness, conceptions of the self, and so on. And we share attempts to integrate meditation with cognitive science and philosophical analysis, and with philosophy as a way of life. So four of us by now uh, who've been on this uh, series are APA certified philosophical counselors. In our next episode, we'll be interviewing Mark Miller, another cognitive scientist and philosopher interested in contemplative studies. Well, we're delighted to have you here today, Massimo. Uh, before we begin with our list of questions for you, about which we might go off script, I'd like to ask John if he'd like to say anything else, or otherwise we'll just dive in with some questions. John? Other than it's it's a great pleasure to have Massimo here. I uh, I regularly involved with the Stoic community. <clears throat> I've spoken at two Stoicons, the most recent one that was online, um, mm -hmm. and I've contributed to uh, Stoicism today. And so I'm very interested in this connection. And I'm very interested in the connections between Stoicism and some of my current work of trying to revise a more ancient notion of rationality that is not so centered on logicality, but is uh, centered on uh, self-correction and the affordance of flourishing and connects up a lot more with the notion of reasonableness than it does to our more logical notion of rationality. And so Stoicism off, uh, obviously provides a nice framework uh, uh, to consider in connection with that. And so those are some of the themes I might want to explore with Massimo, but I'm really happy to follow his lead wherever this goes. 
All right. So, Massimo, tell us a little bit about yourself in your own words. Uh, what are you working on these days and, and what else should the audience know about you up front? Oh, my gosh. What, what, what do I start? So let's <laughs> see. Uh, my, my background actually is in evolutionary biology. Very different from the kind of stuff that I'm, I'm doing now. I was a practicing, empirically minded evolutionary biologist for uh, a couple of decades early on in my career. And then at some point, midlife crisis hit, I decided to veer toward philosophy, went back to uh, graduate school, got my PhD, because I didn't want to just play at a, at, a, at a scientist pretending to be a philosopher. I really wanted to do the real, the real thing. So, and it worked out. Um, of course, my technical field of expertise within philosophy is philosophy of science. It has, it has nothing to do with ancient philosophy at all. But then I got, because of the same sort of midlife crisis that, that triggered the academic shift, I also got interested in practical philosophy. Uh, you know, I grew up as a Catholic in Italy, in Rome. And then I left the church very early on, and ever since I consider myself a secular humanist. But when the first serious crisis in my life started hitting, you know, like things like a divorce or my father dying or something like that, I discovered that actually I did not really have a lot of tools to deal with this, these kinds of situations. And so I thought, oh, let me take a look at the philosophical tradition. Surely I'll find something useful there. And uh, I immediately zoomed in uh, on, uh, on virtual ethics as uh, what I think was the most promising approach. I did the usual stops, Aristotle, the Epicureans, you know, things like that. Uh, neither one of them really spoke to me. And then one day on Twitter, now X, hopefully to go bankrupt very soon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can tell I have opinions about that. <laughs> Uh, I actually got a, this, this tweet that said, help us celebrating, celebrate Stoic Week. And I thought, Stoic Week? What the hell is that? And, and why would anybody want to celebrate the Stoics? You know, I thought at the time I kind of had the usual misconception about the Stoics basically as, as Mr. Spock from Star Trek, right? So trying to stiff up your lip and, and suppress your emotions kind of stuff. But then I remember, wait a minute, but I did read Marcus Aurelius when I was in college. I, I read Seneca. I translated Seneca when I was in high school, in Latin. And I never actually put the two of them together uh, into the same boat. So I said, ah, let's take a look. And the rest is history, as they said. You know, that, that really caught me. Um, and, uh, and ever since I've been devoting more and more of my time to the study, practice, and um, public presentation of Stoicism. Great. All right. So you answered my next question was, how did you come <laughs> upon Stoicism? So um, we can yep. jump down to the next one. Uh, John, at any point, if you want to ask of course. these questions. Of course. Uh, yep. All right. Well, I'll ask the next one. So in the book, uh, the, the Rutledge Handbook on the Philosophy of Meditation, I for foregrounded three questions. Um, and I'm curious what your take is on any or all of them. Um, one, can meditation contribute to philosophy? Two, is there, can there be, or ought there to be a philosophy of meditation? And then three, is meditation itself a form of philosophy? Yeah, those are very good questions. And I'm, I, you can answer them in different ways that, that all make sense to me. Let's start with the second one, I guess, for, for, for um in terms of um, the way I think about things. So is there or can there be, uh, you know, philosophy meditation? Yes. Uh, uh, well, there is, as a matter of fact, the book you put together, is, it's clearly an obvious example of the fact that there is. Also, can there be? Yes, for the simple reason you can do philosophy of anything. Uh, you know, uh, if by philosophy of, we mean uh, critical reflection on a particular topic based on the, uh, on an understanding and discussion of the corpus of that topic, yes, you can do philosophy of pretty much anything, and in fact, people do, as you as you know. The philosophies of uh, have been the major area of development of philosophy throughout at least the second half of the 20th century yeah. in the first part of yeah. the 21st century. You know, so we have philosophy of science, which is my field, which in fact it's not even. Philosophy of science, now it's gotten specialized into philosophy of biology, philosophy of quantum mechanics, and so on and so forth. Uh, you have obviously philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, philosophy of almost anything. So yes, there, there certainly can be. Well, whether there ought to be, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, I would say if, if a topic is interesting enough 
And if enough people are having uh, discussions about that topic, that might be confused by conceptual issues uh, that are concerned with that topic, then yes, there ought to be a philosophy of X. Uh, in this particular case, clearly a lot of people are interested in meditation, and not just scholars, but the general public. There does seem to be a significant amount of confusion or at least disagreement about meditation, mindfulness, and related terminology. So yes, I think there ought to be, I guess, a, uh, a philosophy of meditation. Now, can meditation contribute to philosophy? Ah, that is a good question, actually. Uh, and I'm not sure what, uh, what the answer can be, because I think that that depends on what, what you, one means by philosophy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right? And, and there are different opinions about what that, what that means. So I think I can give a response from the specific perspective that I adopt, which is stoicism in particular and virtue ethics more generally. Um, Yes, in that case, the answer is very clearly yes. Since stoicism, as we'll, we'll see, hopefully, uh, when we get more into the details, but meditating in stoicism is a kind of activity that's very much philosophical in nature. Uh, it has a practical uh, import. The, the goal is, is practical. It's to help people live a better life, but it's most certainly is a type of philosophizing. You, you're supposed to asking yourself questions about, uh, values and how you rank your values and uh, and therefore also at some level defend those rankings at least with yourself you know why am i valuing certain things and not valuing other things and that is philosophizing uh, uh, from a very as i said practical perspective orientation but it certainly is and that answer is i think again from the stoic perspective at least and from the virtue ethics perspective in general answers also the third question is meditation a form of philosophy, certainly the kind of meditation that we do in Stoicism is, uh, because it's it's explicitly reflective, uh, you know, deliberative about whatever it is that you want to, that you're thinking about in terms of values, priorities, actions, why act in certain ways and not other ways. So I guess the answer, at, at least from my perspective, is three uh, to all the three questions is yes. Could I ask a question? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, uh, so that, 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 that brings a question to my mind and I've sort of have an intuitive judgment about this, but that's, that's, it's not well formed. So I'm, I'm open to uh, correction, <laughs> uh, but it seems to me that in that sense, um, stoic meditation and mindfulness practices, cause I think there's also, also contemplative practices that are part of stoicism, but it seems like they have yes. a concern for a connection to rationality, again, broadly construed, uh, a pre-Cartesian notion of rationality, um, that doesn't seem to be uh, foregrounded, explicit, and is often even, in fact, challenged in more Asiatic types of meditation. And I wonder if you, if you think that's a, 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 a legitimate intuition, and if you could comment on that, if you think there's some fruitfulness in there. Yeah, yeah. I think the intuition is is correct, uh, as we, at least as far as I can tell. And the way I would put it is this: the Stoics, uh, first of all, as you were saying earlier on, uh, are not interested just in logic, mm -hmm. as in yeah. you know formal. I mean, they do do that, yes, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, they contributed, in fact, uh, you know, their their propositional logic uh, is was a major contribution to the. Uh, history of of the field in the first place, and it was in fact pretty much the way to do things up until you know Gottlieb Frege in the late nineteenth century. So it's it's certain they were certainly interested in what we would call today formal logic, but for them, logic in general really meant reasonableness. Mm -hmm. It meant mm -hmm. a, a much broader uh, set of activities that include pretty much anything that uh, improve or has the potential to improve the human ability to reason. So it would include, in modern terms, it would include all our psychology, cognitive science, uh, certainly the study of biases, the study of cognitive, uh, you know, uh, biases or fallacies, you know, infor informal fallacies as well as the formal ones. So it's, it is a much broader uh, conception. And I would, I, I agree that it would be better to call that reasonableness rather than logic, even though the term, the, the, the ancient stories yeah. themselves did use this logic. Uh, but, you know, so long as we understand that what they meant was much broader than what we mean today. Uh, now, the, the, 
all of this is connected to the fact that the Stoics thought that a good life is the result of studying and understanding three interrelated fields of inquiry, right? Which they refer to as physics, logic, and ethics. But again, in all, th all those three cases, what they meant was much broader than what we mean today. Physics really came from physis, mm -hmm. which is Greek for nature. So really, in modern terms, that would be the combination of science, metaphysics, and uh, theology, if, 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 in fact, your view of the world includes divinities and gods and stuff like that. So it's understood, I would consider, today I would consider mostly science, but science and metaphysics, you know, a, a understanding of the world. Why? Well, because you, the idea is that it's going to be difficult to live in the world if you have profound misunderstandings about how the world works. Specific example. Uh, if you find yourself in the middle of a pandemic and you don't understand a little bit about, you know, viruses and how they work, you might die. <laughs> you might make the wrong choices, yeah. and uh, you or your or your loved ones are gonna are gonna suffer as a result. So we're not talking about science and metaphysics in the general, you know, very broad sense of, oh, I want to spend my life studying, you know, quantum mechanics. Uh, that's fine. If that's what you want to do. Go ahead. But in terms of, of what the Stoics were interested in, we're talking about a sufficient understanding of the general way in which the world works so that that's going to help you specifically live your life. Second was logic, which, as I said a minute ago, is, again, much broader. Why? Well, because you can know everything you want about the world, but if you don't reason correctly about that knowledge and you try to apply it in a way that makes sense, then it's like if, if you, like you didn't have it. Uh, so you have to have the understanding, but you also have to have to reason correctly about that understanding, the implications of a certain view of, of the world. And then finally, ethics, which also had a much broader mm -hmm. uh, understanding in, in not only for the Stoics, in general for the Greco-Romans. Thank you for watching. This YouTube and podcast series is by the Verveke Foundation, which in addition to supporting my work, also offers courses, practices, workshops, and other projects dedicated to responding to the meaning crisis. If you would like to support this work, please consider joining our Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. By ethics today, typically we mean the study essentially of right and wrong actions, right? So if you do a Kantian deontology or utilitarianism or that sort of stuff. Basically, what you're trying to do is to come up with a universal understanding of what makes an action right or wrong. For the Stoics, that certainly is part of it, but the general idea is, is much, much broader. Ethics really is literally the study of how to live your life, mm -hmm. every aspect of your life. Right. So, Because any decision, from a Stoic perspective, any decision you make has to be appropriate. Any action has to be appropriate. Katakonta was the term that the, that the Stoics used. Katakonta are appropriate actions. That is, you act in the world. Every action that you, that you uh, carry out in the world has implications for yourself and for other people, and therefore it is inherently ethical. That is, it's con it concerns the way in which you want to live with other people. After all, the word ethics itself comes from ethos in Greek, which means character, and it was translated uh, or has connections with the notion of character. And it was translated by Cicero uh, in Latin as moralis, from which we get mora morality. So ethics and morality uh, were not distinguished, uh, at least according, they're not separated according to the ancient Stoics. Morales had to do with mores, that is, with societal uh, you know, rules and, and, and uh, actions in society at large. So the general idea is that ethics or morality has to do with both your character and how that character manifests when you act in, in society. And if you put all those three things together, then it becomes obvious that, yeah, you do want to study logic, but by which one doesn't mean necessarily the intricacies of you know, modern uh, you know, technical uh, aspects of logic. In fact, you don't want to do that. Um, one of the things that the Stoics are very clear, both Epictetus and Seneca, is that if you get yourself too much lost into the details of a, a technical field, then you're losing, mm -hmm. you know, percep uh, um, perception of what is actually important. You're losing, you're not paying attention to what is actually important. There's a, one of my famous, my, one of my favorite passages in Epictetus, however, is about the use of logic. And there's a student who comes up and says, you know, 
why should I study logic? Why shouldn't I not just focus on what's important, which is the, which is the ethics? And Epictetus' response is, well, would you like me to give you an argument for why you would uh, you need to do you need, need logic? And the student says, yes, absolutely, go ahead. And Epictetus says, and how are you going to understand the argument if you don't actually know logic? <laughs> like, ah, <yeah>, right. <laughs> so, yes, logic is important so long as, again, it's, it's applied to actually to, to, the, to the general goal, which is to live a eudaimonic life, a life worth living. So, so if I could follow up on that and maybe bring the connection back. That was excellent, by the way. That was really good. Thank you. Um, but bring it back to the, the you know, the, the topic of meditation proper. Uh, one thing in that, in that sort of logic psychology thing, uh, well, you mentioned two things that really uh, I'm interested in. One was implied, um, and the Stoics, of course, do talk about this, and, and, and Hado has drawn this out, and I want to know what you think about that. And, and this is a place where it's converging with sort of cutting edge cog sci, which is the importance of attention to being reasonable, that the training of attention um, is as important as the training of argumentation. So paying attention appropriately and, uh, you know, and being able to judge situations uh, according to their appropriateness, their proper proportioning. And then that notion of appropriateness, I mean, I, I, this is where my personal academic bias comes in. And of course, everybody's obsessed with their own work. Uh, but I do a lot of work uh, in connection with artificial general intelligence and rationality around um, this ability to zero in on relevant information and connect up to it in a relevant manner. And this is turning out to be, I would argue, and I think more and more people are agreeing with me, that this is turning out to be sort of the key thing about what makes us intelligent, uh, as opposed to merely sort of instinctively reactive to the world and the kind of entities we are. And so there has been an increasing interest within cognitive science because of the notion of the connection between relevance realization, selective attention, sort of comporting yourself so you fit the world correctly um, on mindfulness as trying to get at the core of that. Now, it seems to me at least a reasonable proposal that the Stoics were kind of prescient about this and on to this uh, because they they have, you know, you know, stuff about paying, att paying attention, prosace, and they have another aspect of mindfulness, prochiron, because the original meaning in sati is not the, the Kabat-Zinn, paying attention to the present moment, it's reminding, it's being right. able to bring things into the present moment when it's appropriate uh, to do so, and you're trying to train that. And that seems to line up. Now, I'm not the first person to do this, and, and I, I'm, I, I'm really hesitant to easy uh, equivalencies across Buddhism and Stoicism or something like that. So I, I'm not quite making that claim, but there seems to be, be a more general convergence around, okay, when we're, if we've moved to reasonableness and the, what you've talked about, attention is playing a really important role because attention is, you know, the, the, the first and also significant place in which we're doing this appropriateness judgment and realization and the training of that, but also the training of it so that we remember, uh, so it transfers to the rest of our life. Uh, and those seem to be proper themes of mindfulness within uh, the Asian uh, philosophies. Uh, but I, I want to, I want to give you a chance. Maybe, maybe all I'm doing is giving you a chance to advertise Stoicism. But it seems to me that Stoicism is also properly, you know, prescient in talking about attention, that sense of appropriateness, that the that that, that mindfulness has this reminding aspect to it. Uh, could you comment on that? And before you do, yeah. Massimo, before you yes. do, I just want to mention that. Uh, this is a, a very more complex version of the next question I was going to ask you, which is to just compare the Stoic concept of prosoche and contemporary understandings of mindfulness, meditation, contemplation. It's all in a league as one bigger question. Right. And I, we, I definitely want to go back to the comparison, both with the, my understanding, at least, of the early Buddhist yep. conception of mindfulness and also on, with the, the Kabat-Zinn variety, uh, you know, version uh, modern version, but but first let's talk about so what this what what is it the Stoics actually mean the the word you used is the key, the, the key one prosoche which is typically uh, translated as attention, but sometimes increasingly it's being uh, translated as mindfulness mm -hmm. um, often with the uh, modifier Stoic mindfulness to distinguish it from what might be other kinds of mindfulness. Now, Epictetus devotes an entire section of the discourses. Uh, section 412 uh, to the topic. And in fact, it, the, the title of that section is on attention. Now, 
let me let me give you a flavor of what it is that he's talking about. He says, to what things should I pay attention then? In the first place, to those general principles that you should always have at hand so as not to go to sleep or get up or drink or eat or converse with others without them. Namely, that no one is master over another person's choice and that it is in choice alone that our good and evil lie. And next, we must remember who we are and what name we bear and strive to direct our appropriate actions according to the demands of our social relationships, remembering what is the proper thing to sing, the proper time to play, and in whose company, and what will be out of place, and how we may sh be make sure that our companions don't despise us, and that we don't despise ourselves, when we should joke, and whom we should laugh at, and to what end we should associate with others and with whom, and finally, how we should preserve our proper character when doing so. So this is a long list, which basically summarizes a lot of Stoic philosophy, at least uh, uh, Epictetus' version of it. Basically, what, he, what Epictetus is saying is you need to pay attention to everything you do whenever you interact with other people. He says, you know, you have to remind yourself basic principles, remind yourself of basic principles of Stoicism. In this particular case, the, one of the principles he's talking about is the fact that we pretty much are our choices. And our choices, our judgments, are the things that define us. That's the only thing that, that we control. This is the only thing that, you know, deliberate choices, the kind of things that you sit down and say, okay, should I do this or should I do that? That is, in, in the end, that's who you are. And that's the only thing you control. You don't even control the outcome of those, of those choices because, of course, externals can get in the way, right? I, can, I may decide, for instance, to do... Um, well, it's a good idea for me to go to the gym and, and, and get a little healthier. Great. That's a good choice. That, and that is up to me. Whether I'm actually going to be able to do it or not uh, depends on external circumstances. It's very possible that I'm going to go to the gym, you know, across the street and then a, a car hits me and I break my leg and I'm not going to go to the gym that day, right? As, as a result. So then he's also telling us, you know, we need to remember to pay attention who we are, what name we bear. This is a reference to an important aspect of Stoic philosophy, which is referred to as uh, role ethics. So this notion that in life we have, we, we take on a number of roles, uh, varying from roles that are imposed on us or attributed to us by the circumstances, you know, you're somebody's son, for instance, that's not your choice, to roles that we choose within, within the circumstances of our lives. You know, I decided to you start one particular career rather than another, so on and so forth, and the broader role of being a human being. Uh, the, the, the Stoics were cosmopolitan, so the most important thing for them was, in fact, to remind yourself that you are a member of a broad family that encompasses all humanity. A bunch of things follow from those reminders and from those roles, and Epictetus is saying, you know, you should pay attention to it. Now, why should I pay attention to it? Because, he says in the same section, when you relax your attention for a while, do not fancy you will recover it whenever you mm. please. But remember this, that because of your fault of today, your affairs must necessarily be in a worse condition in future occasions. Right? So he says, look, uh, it's not like you can do, you know, you can go and, and, and do other things, not paying attention to what you're doing. And all of a sudden you say, oh, I'm, let me go back to it. And as, as you know, there is actually a lot of research today that backs up this point. That is, it's not easy to multitask, as we would say today, to shift your attention back and forth to different things. The more you do that, the worse you're going to be carrying out each one of those tasks, which I keep trying to repeat to my students. There's no such a thing as multitasking. Exactly. There is only there is no very point. rapid sequential yes, tasking, yes. <laughs> right? And finally, uh, Epictetus says, very little is needed for everything to be upset and ruined. Only a slight lapse in reason. It's much easier for a, a mariner to wreck his ship than it is for him to keep it sailing safely. All he has to do is have a little more upwind and disaster is instantaneous. In fact, he does not have to do anything. A momentary loss of attention will produce the same results. So he's saying the reason you want to pay attention is because nothing has ever been improved by not paying attention to it. <laughs> if, if you just do things without paying attention, you're not going to get them done well. So attention, prosoke, again, is the, is the word that Epictetus uses and Marcus Aurelius uses, is in fact crucial to Stoic practice in that sense. Interestingly, Seneca translates that in Latin because both Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius wrote in Greek. 
And so they both use prosoke. In Latin, Seneca uses the same concept, but he uses two words, animum advertere, which means to turn the mind to. So you're turning your mind, you're paying attention, you are, you know, if you're doing something, if you're, folk, if you, if you're carrying out a task, you pay attention to that task, like what I'm doing right now, right? So I'm having a conversation with you guys, what did I do? I'm looking at my computer screen, so the first thing that I did before we started the conversation was to turn off all the notifications on my computer. Because for the duration of this meeting, because otherwise I'm going to start getting distracted. It's like, oh, there's something popping up out there, right? And I'm trying to be in an environment in my home, in my apartment in Brooklyn. There's nobody else in the in the apartment. There are no sounds. You know, I turned off the the dishwasher, that sort of stuff. Why? Because I want to pay attention. Once we're done, then I can go back to whatever else needs to be done and and pay attention to it. So that's pretty much what the Stoics mean by mindfulness, by by prosoking. Now, Rick, you want to go back to the to the con comparison with Buddhism? Um, well, I, I know you wrote about it in your chapter for the book. I'm just well, like, what's the major difference? Would you say is between the Stoic approach to not just meditation or prosoke, but to mm -hmm. con the contemplative and meditative practices versus maybe you know John Cabot Zinn or what the popular Western secularized interest in med which is not the same thing as all the Asia ancient. Asian traditional practices, but just say a little bit about any of those differences um, for the audience. Yeah, that's a great question, which of course comes up often because um, as, as John was saying, there often are people pointing to parallels between or convergences between Buddhism and Stoicism. And I do think there are a, there are a number of them, especially in the ethics. The metaphysics is very different, but, but at least between the ancient versions of the metaphysics, modern Buddhists may actually agree more with modern Stoics, but, but in terms of the ancient philosophy, the metaphysics is very different. In terms of the ethics, on the other hand, there are a lot of parallels. Um, however, there are also some differences, and it is important to keep, keep uh, the differences in mind, not because we need to engage in any kind of, this is better than, this, than the other one. Uh, you know, whatever works for somebody, if, if Buddhism works for you as a philosopher of life, go for it. If Stoicism works for you, go for it. And, um, I'm interested. I tend to be more interested in the in the parallels, in the convergences, than in the differences. But nevertheless, the differences are there. Now that said, the the big caveat here is that I am not an expert on Buddhism. I have read about Buddhism, and I have you know some of my best friends are Buddhists, as they say. Um, but I'm relying basically on secondhand sources. So my understanding is uh, there. These are the major differences, especially between the prosoke understood as as stoic mindfulness and the, the Buddhist tradition. Let me start with perhaps the easier one, which is the, the John Kabat-Zinn version, uh, the modern version of mindfulness, as in his famous mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, kind of thing. So uh, Kabat-Zinn says that, that mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. Now, stoic mindfulness is, in fact, pay attention in a particular way, on purpose and in the present moment. However, it's very much judgmental. Uh, the notion of non-judgmental, that, no, that's, that's kind of the point. I mean, you, you've heard Epictetus, uh, right? You have to pay attention to what you're doing because otherwise you're not doing it well. So you have to constantly uh, correct your, your, the way in which you're doing things. You, you pay attention to the way you're acting and you you, it's interesting that he uses the example, the analogy of a mariner, of, of, uh, you know, of uh, somebody who is piloting a ship. What do you do when you pilot your ship? You try to do your best. You pay attention. You also correct your course constantly, right? So you have, which implies that you're making judgments about, well, is the course the one that I want? And if it isn't, if I'm going off course, you also have to come up with a judgment, a reasonable judgment of how do I correct it, in which direction, and by how much. Right. So a major difference, I think, between the uh, Kabat-Zinn version of mindfulness and the Stoic one is is about these judgments. Could, could I just for Kabat -Zinn, could I just interject yeah, there? Go ahead. Uh, you're you're mm -hmm. being kinder sure. than I have been in publication. I think the, I think the <laughs> Kabat-Zinn runs into a self-contradiction of describing what is meant by non-judgment when, of course, 
Um, there's all kinds of judgment happening. You bring your attention back from the distraction. You try to uh, look at it in right a, a certain kind of way. You're trying to follow. Like I think there's a confusion of judgment with inference in there. You're not. You're, I get. I get what I think. What Kabat-Zinn is trying to say is you. You don't get into any inferential elaboration or something like that, or theoretical generation or emotional re reactivity. You're, but to claim no judgment, I think is just, I think he's mis, there, I think there's either a contradiction there, a performative contradiction, uh, or maybe a propositional one, or there is a misunderstanding of judgment as something that is, is equated to theorizing, which I think is just an inappropriate uh, understanding of what judgment means. Um, yeah. So that makes I, sense to me. Yeah, I would that, I would add sense. that just judging that something is a distraction or that mind wandering is something negative and all those things involve judgments. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think he means something simplistic, like don't be um, angry at yourself because your mind wandered or or don't think anything less of yourself because of the peculiarly bizarro thought that you just had about your mother-in-law or something like that. You know, like don't don't judge on that level. But that's not don't judge at all. Yeah, that makes no sense. Right. right. And, and and again, you're being a little bit kind direct than I would be. I think that's fair if uh, uh, mindfulness based stress reduction was a new thing. Uh, but it's not a new <laughs> right. thing, and it has right. a long history in which people have gone off on this tangent of confusion that we are talking about, and there has been no significant correction to that. Oh, in the traditional Buddhism, it's so much more like what Massimo is yes. saying about stoic yeah. judgment, which is something is either dharmic or adharmic. It's either leaving to leading, leaning toward the telos of nirvana and mental freedom and all that kind of like virtue epistemological growth, or it's the opposite. It's, it leads to mental bondage. So there's a, there's a pro or con attitude about the things that arise in, in traditional Buddhist meditation. I de, I, I de-emphasize or downregulate those kinds of things, but that's a good, compassion is good. I'm going to upregulate those emotions and thoughts when they happen. So there's so much more going on in the traditional thing than in this uh, kind of neutered, secularized, Thing. Yeah. 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 The, the, well, now, sorry, go the ahead. Buddha in one of his parables compares it to, you know, uh, a, a person forging a sword, the metalworking and the and the forming of the sword, which is very much the kind of judgment that Massimo is talking about right now. The person making the sword and the person sailing are, are engaged in a very similar kind of flowing, ongoing, procedural, skillful judgment. Right. With this uh, feedback loop. Too, yeah. Right. With, exactly. with the sea captain. OK, yeah. the, the navigation was off a little and or the wind. Or so I have to. Yeah. I'm taking feedback from the environment. If I wasn't paying attention to what actually the world or the metaphysics or the science is showing me. Right. And reasoning properly about it, I can't do the right thing. So yeah. all those factors are present. And I think in the stoic sense of mindfulness, which, by the way, Masma, I wanted to say when you were talking about. Uh, what's the what's the point of it? If you could lose it in one moment of inattentiveness, that I, I, and I've, I've used this in a way that I know John disagrees with me about this, that I, I'm I, even in favor of what they call mic mindfulness, because I'm in favor of anything that reduces mindlessness, even if it's sort of confused in the way that we were just talking. Mindlessness is what happens in that moment of inattention. <laughs> So any exercises that will increase anyone's attentiveness skills, to me, that's an improvement over the absence thereof. <laughs> now, in at, at, by the next bit, I'm very happy to be uh, corrected by you gentlemen. <laughs> but my understanding is that sati, you know, mindfulness in, in, in the early Buddhist tradition, is a practice of watching uh, four objects of attention as they arise and they pass in, into our consciousness. And these are the body, feelings, the functioning of the mind, and the qualities of the mind. Now, the goal seems to be, to, from what I understand, is for the agent to remain focused on those four areas and it, while at the same time setting aside concerns about anything that is external uh, to it. Therefore, in a, in a sense, it's really studying, uh, carefully studying, paying attention to one's own phenomenological experience of of thinking of your, 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 your the way your mind works right so um and one takes does take note of what phenomena are helpful or hurtful how did they are uh, they 
helpful or hurtful and what makes them arise and seize, etc. So sati seems to me to be the careful self-study of one's physical and mental experiences. That does that make sense? I, I would add to it this the 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 part that uh, about the remembrance that's in the notion of sati. Um, and in fact, a lot of this feedback, you're not going to get in the act of the sitting meditation. You're going to get it as you're enacting the eightfold path and that it's understood that that mindfulness functions organically, ecologically within the eightfold path and not as an isolated technique. Although it is a, okay, it is a disciplined practice yes, that you yes. practice separate from the activity, but it, it, there is the other elements like in Stoicism of the discipline of desire and the discipline of judgment. Mm -hmm. They're just kind of framed slightly differently, like right belief, yeah. right intention, right speech, yes. right action. Right. So you are supposed to integrate it, but you can practice it just like practicing lifting weights will improve your muscles, but then you need to use your muscles when you're, you're doing other things. Yeah. Excellent. I, I, li I like that analogy. So um, again, there are, there seems to me, to me to be, both similarities and perhaps a little bit of a difference with the stoic approach the stoic approach is also the stoics often use the analogy with athletics you, you go to the gym you 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 exercise or with or the analogy with medicine with health uh you're doing whatever it's, it is that it's going to make you healthy uh not in a physical sense but in a mental uh you know in a, in a character sense one of the possible differences it uh, lies into these um Thing that I mentioned that that while you while you're doing the sati, you are setting aside concerns for externals. It comes later. It comes in the eightfold path. For the Stoics, the concern for the externals is is pretty much the point of doing the exercise. Uh, I love one of the analogies that Epictetus uses. He says you should play ball like Socrates did, <laughs> meaning that you know when you play ball, the important thing is not the ball. The ball is the external, represents the external, right? And the ball is given to you um, by the circumstances. And it doesn't matter what the color is, what the material is, what the size is. That's not the point. The point is, can you play skillfully? Can you play in a way, you know, to the best of your abilities? The circumstances are given to you in Stoic metaphysics by the universe. The, your only choice, your only, your only sort of agency uh, rely, consists in Okay, given these circumstances, what am I going to do? Right. So I get sick because a virus hit me. All right. Uh, am I going to bitch and moan about it? And I'm going to be nasty to the people that are going to take care of me or something? Or I'm going to say to myself, ah, well, this happens. Uh, you know, let's see, try to get through it. Let's try to be nice to the people that are helping me because after all, they're trying to help me. That sort of stuff. So things happen and, um, and your, your major locus of decision making is, how am I going to deal with this thing? And so the attention to the externals is very much the focus for the Stoics, not because the externals themselves are actually inherently important. What's important is how you play with those externals, how you actually handle them, right? Virtue, in a sense, uh, from a Stoic perspective, consists precisely in the ability to play correctly with the externals, uh, right? So for the Stoics, famously, and somewhat paradoxically, uh, happiness doesn't depend on things like health and wealth and reputation and career and all that sort of stuff. It depends on how you handle whether you're healthy or, or sick, whether you're wealthy or poor, whether you have a career emperor or, or a so slave. On. Yeah. <laughs> right. Whether you're an emperor or a slave. Exactly. Right. Excellent. Um, all right. So Let's ask you another question, maybe shift the topic a little bit. Could you like, would you like to share some of your own stoic meditative practices or trainings, anything like that? What? Yeah, with my friend Greg Lopez, who is incidentally both a stoic and a practice Buddhist, uh, we actually co-wrote a book a few years ago called The Handbook for New Stoics, where we put together a number of um, practices, not just meditative, but you know, actual exercises from the Stoic tradition, mostly from Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and a little bit from Seneca. And I have also a, my you know, personal subset of those practices, which I actually do on a regular basis. So the major, there are some meditative or contemplative strat, uh, um, 
strategies that this that the Stoics use. One of the ones that I like a lot is uh, a what what is called the premeditatio malorum, I, thinking about bad things happening, basically, which is needs to be done in a particular way because otherwise it can actually backfire if you if you do it in a very emotional way. If you start thinking, oh my gosh, all sorts of bad stuff is going to happen to me, you're just going to freak yourself out, and you're going to get into a you know cycle of anxiety. The the idea is to prepare yourself mentally for a for a negative outcome of something that you're about to do so that you know how to handle it, so that you can develop, first of all, you accept the negative outcome because sometimes in life things go that, you know, your way and other times they don't. So, uh, and, and you ready yourself to deal with that situation, with that outcome. So for instance, uh, let's say, let's pick a particular example. Let's say that tomorrow morning I'm scheduled to go for a job interview, right? It comes natural to us to, to first of all, hope that we're going to get the job, which for the Stoics already is, is starting off the wrong on the wrong foot because getting the job is not up to you. It's up to external circumstances. It depends on a number of factors that you don't control, such as your competition, who are doing the interview, how they're doing the interview, et cetera, et cetera. What is up to you is to do the best interview you can, right? to prepare in, in the best way you can. The premeditatio malorum consists of before you go to the interview, you very slowly and very deliberately and non-emotionally, you describe to yourself as if you were a camera, what might happen and what might go wrong so that if in fact things go wrong, they don't go the way you, you hope, you're okay with them. You're, you're mentally prepared. Seneca says, you know, the best thing that a mind can do about, about events is to prepare itself for any kind of, of outcome, because that way you're going to react properly. You're going to say, okay, well, I knew that this was a job interview. I knew that uh, there was a chance that I wouldn't get the job. That's fine. I'm going to go and apply for another job. I'm going to, you know, there's, there, there's going to be other, other chances. So um, there is evidence in modern cognitive behavioral therapy that this is actually very useful. If you do it properly, as I said, if you start doing it emotionally, it's like, oh my God, I'm not going to get my, my job and this is going to be a catastrophe and, you know, I'm going to never recover from it. And, but then, then you're actually doing it very much the wrong way. Um, so that's one of the things that I do on a regular basis. A broader kind of sort of contemplation uh, technique that the Stoics have is uh, also will sound very strange to non-Stoics, and that is a contemplation on death. And there are a number of ways of do, doing it. The, the reason to do it is because, you know what? It's going to happen to everyone, uh, right? At some point, you're going to get there. And uh, in fact, Seneca even goes so far as saying that philosophy is largely a preparation for your ultimate test for what's going to happen when you're facing your own mortality. That may be perhaps a little bit of an exaggeration, but certainly is, is part of what you want to do. And... Um, there are a number of ways to do it. My favorite one is simply from time to time to go into a nice cemetery and walk around, paying attention to the headstones, read the names, read the dates, uh, pay attention to all of these people that are gone. And, you know, I'm going to be joining them at some point soon. It could be, you know, 20 years down the road. It could be tomorrow. You, you don't know. Part of the exercise is to remind yourself that you actually don't know that. Again, if you do this emotionally, it's not going to be pleasant because you're going to, again, freak yourself out and say, ah, I'm going to die. This is going to be a really bad thing. But if you do that reasonably, to use John's term, not, not rationally in the strict sense of the term, but reasonably, then what you're doing is you simply prepare yourself to accept something that is natural, that's unavoidable, and therefore it will be irrational or unreasonable not to accept it. And at the same time, you get out of that experience, you, you do the your little round around the cemetery, you get out of it and say, hey, but it's not happening today. So what can I do today in order to enjoy my life for the next day, for the next year, for the next decade, whatever it is, the time that I have left? Uh, premeditation on death is, in fact, a way not only to prepare yourself to accept something that is inevitable and natural, but also to remind yourself that that very point is to live life to your utmost precisely because it has an end, an end date and because you don't know what the end date is. And so you don't want to waste your time uh, doing things that, uh, that you're not going to regret not doing on your, on your deathbed. But Massimo, I'm um, just curious, 
I mean, you said like a camera with the premeditatio malorum, but like for a beginner listening to this right now who wants to go and try this, what is specific instructional advice that you might give them? Uh, good question. So th there are different ways of doing it. My favorite, since I tend to be more a, a person oriented on writing uh, rather than visualizing, for instance, uh, then I, I actually do it by writing in my personal journal. Uh, I sit down and I, and I journal about it, right? But that's because the way my mind works. Other people do it visually. And so what you do is you get you know, a moment in your, in your house when you're, it's quiet and um, uh, there's no, no disturbances. You close your, your eyes and you imagine the, the specific situation we're talking about, let's say the job interview, very slowly and very deliberately, as if you were a camera, as if you were describing the situation, you'd zoom in or, or zoom out, whatever it is that needs to be done in your mind's eye. And then you repeat that a number of times as slowly as possible. For some people that really works. And as I said, for other people, on the other hand, I, I don't, I'm not, I get distracted too easily when I try to visualize things for a, for a uh, sustained period of time. So I prefer to write. Uh, so two ways of doing it are, are either journaling about it or a close your eye visual uh, meditation. Yeah. Would you say that um, journaling at night, this is a stoic thing, reflecting retroactively on the day and thinking about one thing you could have done better is a kind of post meditatio? maybe a way of describing correct yeah. that's right and that is actually something that i do uh, almost every night just for a few minutes both seneca and epictetus explicitly describe that technique epictetus says do not let your tender eyelids close before you examine <laughs> <laughs> uh what you've done during the day ask yourself you know what did i do right what did i do wrong and what could i do better and those are three nice interesting questions what did i do wrong it's not in order so to beat yourself up uh, because regret is not a stoic thing. Uh, whatever you did, it's done. Uh, it's not. It's you know. It's not like you can go back in time, and uh, and change it. However, you do want to learn from your experiences. So when you write down in using ideally non-emotional language, and in fact the Stoics even suggest to use a second person, like Marcus Cerullus does in the Meditations. So you you write a, as if you were writing a letter to a friend. And there is evidence from modern kind of science that doing it that way, using non-emotional language and the second person actually is helpful because you distance yourself from the emotional aspect of the experience. So, so what did I do wrong? You want to learn from your experiences. Uh, what did I do right? Well, that's because you also want to pay attention, prosoke again, to the kinds of stuff that actually you did right because over time the goal is to do fewer and fewer of the things that – went wrong and more and more are the things that went right. So you need to have both uh, points of comparison, so to speak. And then probably the third one, the third question is the most important one. What could I do better the next time? You know, even though we tend to think of our lives as endlessly fascinating and varied, they, they kind of repeat itself themselves. You know, situations repeat themselves on a regular basis. We get up in the morning, we go to, you know, we see the same people. We go to work, we see the same people and do pretty much the same thing. Then during the weekend, we go out for friend, with friends, etc. So there's not that much variety, which means that similar situations will repeat themselves over and over. And so if I have uh, encountered a situation which I did not handle particularly well, I'm going to want to make a note of it. And also, I want to make a note of, well, should something like this happen again, let's say a discussion with a colleague or a, a fight with my wife or something like that, how am I going to do it next time? What can I do better the next time? Again, the idea being your mind needs to be prepared. If you're prepared, you're going to react be better the next time around. Great. Well, um, we only have a couple of minutes left, so uh, we like to always let the guest uh, end with whatever they like to say, but also uh, which includes plugging your work or how yep. to contact you or any thought that came to your mind that you didn't get to share with us. But we really enjoyed this conversation, Massimo. Thank you. This this was very enjoyable. Well, in terms of sort of, sort of par parting words, uh, I think one important thing to understand, uh, in my opinion, about practical philosophy is that whatever works for you as we were saying earlier do it the important thing is to engage into re reflective exercises about what do you want to do in life why you want to do it and what is the best way to do it whether you adopt a stoic framework or a buddhist framework or something else that works 
uh, matters much less than actually doing it. Of course, there are also really bad philosophies of life. <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't recommend fascism to anybody, for instance, as a, as a life philosophy. Um, but among the, the ones that work, there, there is a number of choices. And to some extent, uh, people want to pick whatever resonates with them, both culturally uh, at a level of individual character and you know personality and so on and so forth. As for where to find me, uh, well, I'm not on social media um, deliberately on, on purpose, but I am on Substack, and uh, so I publish there under uh, a newsletter called Fix in Winter, uh, which is about stoicism, virtue ethics more generally. And if people are interested, they can find me there. Great. Thank you so much, Massimo. John? You also have a wide variety of books that I'm sure that people can find on Amazon that are, are excellent presentations of your work as well. Massimo, this has been a great pleasure. Um, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation and I'm, um, I'm, I'm really pleased with the connections that you were making and the comparisons. I think that's very helpful. Um, I think one of the biases that people carry around in the West is that only the East can talk about a lot of these topics with any philosophical or spiritual depth. And I think what you're doing is making a very clear case you now that the, the, the West has within its history also a profound uh, cultivation of wisdom, philosophy as a way of life. So thank you very, very much for that. Yeah. Thank you, Massimo. Um, this has been excellent. It's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. Thank you both. <laughs>